Hello, my friends. Welcome to a brand new series I'm launching today called Can You Talk Real Quick? It's like a mini pod, like a shorter conversation where I reach out to a friend, a guest, an expert analyst that I know that I've got in my phone, and I quickly turn around a conversation about an important issue that might be unfolding or that is ongoing where there are new or no developments like on the debt ceiling today with Christine Romans of CNN. Very excited to have Christine being my first guest on Can You Talk Real Quick, which will also allow us to get together real quick using Zoom or Discord, something terrible happens, something amazing happens. We want to talk real quick about it so that we feel connected, that we can understand how we should think about something, and so that we just don't feel alone. It's an idea that lets us leverage the audience, the community. Yeah, I just use the word leverage. Use each other to talk real quick. So I don't know how often I'll do this, but I think you get the idea. Today, it's Christine Romans joining us. She's the chief business correspondent at CNN. She's also the host of Early Start. She anchors that show every morning at 5 a.m. and does an amazing job. And today, I wanted to talk real quick with her about what's going on with the debt ceiling. The latest news and analysis on the debt ceiling negotiations, debt ceiling doom, debt ceiling disaster. Let's go over to CNN's Christine Robbins, who I called in her office in Manhattan, where they were having a certain party for a certain someone that's going from mornings to evenings. Follow Christine on social media. Go to the show links for all of the information on Christine Romans. Get her books. Watch her on CNN at 5 a.m. every day. Let's talk real quick with Christine. All right, Christine Romans on the phone with me now. It's been way too long, but we're always excited when you're able to join us. Thank you for, I guess, I don't know, staying at work. You get there very early for your amazing <coughs> show, Early Start. How are you? I'm great. I mean, we're heading into a, a there won't be any morning, noon or night come pretty soon. We only have four trading days left until we hit this <laughs> this debt ceiling X date. So it's about to get to be a 24-hour routine, I think. How are you paying attention to, as someone that is closely reporting and paying attention to this, the negotiations in Washington, D.C.? Because I keep going to Google News and hitting like the latest debt ceiling reporting and different outlets are covering it. But how, how do you know what's exactly where they're at? So, you know, I'm letting like Manu Raju and our Hill team really handle the negotiation back and forth, because a lot of that is political theater that I'm going to be real honest, I have very little patience for. (laughs) I've been really focused on the securities industry side of it, like what's going to happen? How are they going to be able to make payments on bonds? How are they going to be able to make interest payments? Does the vast plumbing of the treasury borrowing system, do we have the capability to be able to see a bill that's coming due and decide to put pause on that one and to pay a different one, yeah. you know, and, and we're, we're not really built to not pay our bills. So that's what I've been really focused on is how are they going to juggle flaming chainsaws and not go uh, into a default? <laughs> that's fine. We're not really built to not pay our bills. <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's an insane thought to think about doing you've been covering about what the potential damage could be my question right now is has there any permanent damage or severe damage yet so i think there is damage to the prestige and i don't mm. know how to measure that but i've been talking to people who who cover and are in the um you know the credit rating world and at some point it and i just said this on on cnn on air at some point it's not a bug to have a fight over the debt ceiling, it becomes a feature. And that's, you know, we've raised the debt ceiling 76 times since 1960, 49 times under Republican presidents, 29 times under Democrats. Maybe that that, that doesn't add up to 76, maybe that's 78 times, but whatever. That's generally what we've done. And for most of that time, it was not a big deal until 2011. So now we've got more than a decade of this becoming a political tool and a political dysfunction that is... endangers our standing in the world. I mean, we are the place everybody wants to park their money. The U.S. Treasury bond is our superpower, right? It allows us to exert influence all over the world, right? In enforcing sanctions. I had a guest on this week who was telling me, like, everything that we do in the world that makes us strong and, um, I guess, forceful in terms of, you know, American ideals and democracy, it's because we're backed by treasuries. And we're talking right now about undermining that because of a fight over spending. And Pete, I, I would say this. You know, there is an argument or, dis- or decisions to be made about America's debt and deficits. This is the least efficient p- way to do that. I mean, this is not 
we're not even talking about, as Mark Sandy said on my show this week, we're not even talking about the things that are driving the debt. We're talking about non-defense discretionary spending. That's like a little piece of the pie. That's not right. even we're, we're threatening. We're threatening something really terrible to our prestige in the financial system over not even meaningful. Okay, there's a party happening, but, but they're saying goodbye to Caitlin Collins right next to me. <laughs> Do you want me to move to a different phone? No, I love it. We're getting the inside scoop. That's fun. Yeah, they're having a champagne toast for Caitlin, who's going from to the moving from mornings to nights. She's not leaving. Yep, yep. And everybody <laughs> loves her, by the way. Everyone loves her, so there's a lot of people here. I love Caitlin too. <laughs> I feel bad that we're talking during the party now. It's okay. They can't even see me. Okay. Well, it, it, it's also the other thing that I think is really important, and everybody that you've talked to, I'm reading your latest pieces at CNN.com, everybody that you're talking to in the world of investment or, or credit ratings, it says the same thing. What do they say around the same thing? What do they say about the debt ceiling? Well, they just say, raise it or get rid of the damn thing. Like mm. now that it's become this political tool and not an actual article of fiscal restraint, just just get just get rid of it. Now it's just causing more problem. It's not useful. It's it's over. You know, we, we need to do, and I've said this over and over again, they need to form a bipartisan commission. Let's look at our debt and deficits and spending in the era post-COVID now, right? And post, post all that emergency spending. Let's really take a significant look at it like we did Simpson Bowles and we've done over and over again, which by the way, Congress never actually never actually accepts those recommendations anyway, but raise the debt ceiling and have a big, bigger talk about spending priorities and do that. Or how about you just budget like, you, like you're supposed to through the normal budgetary process. You know, this is, this is not where you make spending decisions. You make that at the ballot box and in the budget process, not when the credit card bill is due. That just doesn't make any sense. It just seems like it's not about fiscal policy at all. It's only about politics. Is that fair to say? Well, I think... I don't know. I mean, Republicans will tell you that this is the only chance they have to rein in a wild, drunken Democratic Party that wants to spend, spend, spend. And they don't want to set, you know, because the White House has sort of said that they would freeze spending at current levels. And their Republicans are like, no, 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 no. Current levels are way. No, no. The last two years, we've spent more money. You know, they would say Democrats have spent more money and they don't want to set a baseline at, you know, Biden era um, spending levels. So they, they're, they, they will talk with moral conviction about how they're doing this for their grandchildren. So it's just a real philosophical clash right now. But do you think it's a philosophical crash? Uh, because they raised the debt ceiling three times when they had a Republican president. And if they're going to be concerned about the debt, nothing will destroy the debt more than this brinksmanship. I mean, I feel well, like or, that's pretty straightforward. Or, or, or Republicans think that any Debt default will be a Biden default, and they will be able to brand it as a Biden default. Oh, no doubt about and that's that. What yeah. they're, that's yeah. what they're, they're hoping, you know. And, and there's criticism from Democrats of the, the White House messaging on this, that they've been too, sure. they sort of try to take this high road and said, no, we're going to raise the debt ceiling, you know, and that they didn't, they underestimated kind of the um, the messaging prowess of the Republican Party. Again, that's all that Washington bullshit, honestly. And I, I say that, you know. You don't have to bleep me. I mean, that that's the stuff that I can't, it just drives me nuts because where I am over here, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to make sure our bonds, our bonds are paid. So that means grandma's not going to get her social security check on time. And that drives me crazy in the biggest, the biggest economy in the world that we have to be deciding whether veterans, I have a list in front of me of all the things that are coming due January 1st, January 2nd, so Medicare, 47 billion, social security, 25 billion, a veterans benefits, 12 billion. Uh, two billion for what's this one? This is Medicaid. Like, there, there's money that's going to come in on June fifteenth. That's going to be um, corporate and state tax. Anybody who does court files quarterly taxes, that money comes in on June fifteenth. We might be able to limp, maybe. I mean, there's a smallish percent chance that you could limp to June fifteenth. Why are we operating like this? Why are we operating like this? This is ridiculous. You know, we shouldn't we just shouldn't even be in this position. We shouldn't be in this position, but I but wonder I want yeah, yeah, we are. I wonder if we can really have it's hard to have a conversation anymore, even about fiscal policy, if you don't agree on some of the basic things. And Democrats have been saying for a long time, and as far as I can tell, all the you know, economists and financial people that I trust and read and and talk to say that tax cuts without equivalent spending cuts, blow holes in deficit. 
and Republican orthodoxy is not that they do not believe that the tax cuts create budget deficits and debt. I, I don't know how you yeah. they just I, had a so hearing I, uh, about that I, at the Senate with all these experts. Go ahead. Sorry. So I don't get all that. Orthodox, I, can't, I don't care about any of that orthodoxy. All I know is when I look at America's debt and deficits, there are four things that are driving them. Medicare costs, Social Security costs, net interest on our debt and tax receipts that are too low. So translation, that means you have to figure out how to cut spending or index spending to income or raise taxes on Social Security and Medicare, you know, for raise the cap, you know, the payroll cap. And you've got to maybe raise taxes somewhere. And only one party wants to raise taxes and only one party wants to cut taxes. And um, the net interest on the day, you can't do anything about. So, you know, that's what a commission has to do and make it. You have to have a bipartisan hard work to make to make unpopular choices to fix that problem. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody is talking about what you really have to do to fix the problem, which is also really, really frustrating. Yeah. And I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel with that conversation in any kind of normal budgetary process. Do you? No, I mean, we've already we're heading into a presidential election year where both parties have already said that, you know, nobody's going to touch Medicare and Social Security. You know, and I, and if you not touching Medicare, so Pete, not touching Medicare and Social Security is the equivalent, Social Security at least, not touching Social Security is equivalent of a 25% Social Security cut in, in, in 10 years. You know what I mean? I mean, if you don't do anything, right. you will, you're not going to have enough money and you will automatically have a cut. So you have to do something. You, they have to do something. Well, the easiest thing to be, in my understanding, everybody says the same thing is you can raise the cap and you can. Yes. Yes, it it would be, yes. but, the, but the Republicans are sworn they have a blood oath to not raise any taxes, Tax, any taxes, quote unquote taxes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't and know. I mean, they they just gotta. I mean, that's why I keep. I was talking to Maya McGinnis, who's you know budget hawk, who's very very good about all this stuff. I talked to her last week, maybe last, it's all running together, Pete. But um, you know, I'll read it. I got the quote. Got, I got the they, quote in front of they, me. They, I'll, I'll read what she read wrote. It, read it. Read yeah, it. She wrote the problem is we no longer budget. In fact, neither budget committee has even bothered to put forth a budget this year. Uh, we need to reform the debt ceiling because the risk of default only makes our economic and fiscal situation more precarious. But we need to replace it with something that would force lawmakers to adopt savings packages rather than the continued borrowing binge they are on. I thought that President Biden put forward a budget and that Republicans hadn't, but maybe that's not that's not the budget committee, I guess, is what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean they just gotta we've been haven't we been operating on continuing resolutions for like how long, you know, where we just keep it's just so frustrating. Yeah. Can you just tell me, you know, like I am a dispassionate observer of all of these things, except when it's so when it's it's like it's like that old like we're eating our young, you know, it's like, what are we doing? What are we, this is like, what are we doing? Literally, <laughs> well, even, not literally, but I mean, we're thinking about the next generation. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, and, and look, and people who want spending cuts, they would, they are just as passionate about saying, we're doing this so that we don't pass all this debt onto our, on, onto the, you know, onto our children and grandchildren. And then fine, but this is not how you do it. You don't do it by blowing up the system so that interest rates spike, making it all more expensive to borrow money anyway. I, it, it just, this isn't the place to have this, this, this fight. I, and never, buy, I are, never buy that anymore. Worried about passing the debt. When will that stop being a concern? I, I've been reading so many people, you know, talking about from anything from modern monetary theory, Stephanie Kelton and, and others. Do, do you, I mean, do you really see that as being a concern? We've been talking about this for years. At, yeah. At some point, at some point, the interest on the debt will choke out, out the amount of money we have available to invest in other things. It will limit our, it will limit our choices. If it continues growing like this, it will limit our choices. Now, the question is, you know, you can raise taxes. Um, you can, you can yeah. smartly cut spending in certain areas. You can, um, you know, it, it, like when I say anything about Social Security, and Medicaid, Medicare, by the way, I get all this hate mail. You know, this is our money. We were promised this, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And I get it. But um, but we got to look at how to make the system work better for everyone. We have an aging population, you know, and we need to figure out how everybody's going to be able to be supported and how the, the, the math works, how the math works. Again, but that's not the discussion that's happening right now because we're not talking about Social Security. We're not right. talking about any of those things. You know, we're talking about food stamps for for the working poor, you know, or wh- whatever. I mean, we're we're talking about other stuff. Yeah. Work requirements for the working poor, yeah. which, by the way, my understanding is 
even if Democrats conceded to work requirements, uh, the federal government agency that would uh, process them and and make sure people were, quote, working has been gutted. So they wouldn't be able to even do the job. It's like uh, you're, you're yeah, demanding. And it's raising, that- there are some there are work requirements. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, a bit, but, but they're raising it from 50 to 55. You know, so it's for mm-hmm. able bodied people who are receiving these benefits. From the age of 50 to 55, we need to work 20 hours a month, I think, which is, you know, I mean, I don't know that we have a work problem in this country at the moment, but I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a philosophical, it's a, again, it's a philosophical argument happen, happening around the very basis of our economy and what makes our economy great, which is, I keep saying it's our superpower, this ability to, we could borrow whatever we want. And people would lend it to us. Yeah, I want to just go back to that. Uh, America's borrowing is its superpower. A default would tarnish that. You've touched on it, but how, how is our borrowing our superpower? Because we, be, we, because we are the most important and safest, safest financial instrument in the world. Our bonds. Everybody has them. They hold them for safety. I mean, every government holds them, pension funds, people, um, governments, and that makes the U.S. dollar the world's reserve currency. So commodities are traded in dollars, and options markets are in dollars, and we, we are the behemoth. We are the backbone of the, of the global economy, and that gives us tremendous influence on the world stage for all kinds of different reasons. And so we have an obligation, I think, to, for our politics at least, to act accordingly, right? And not actually try to tear down the very system that is what makes us so strong, right? Now, you again, you can have a conversation about, you don't want to just borrow as much money as you can because you can. But if we needed to borrow money for COVID spending, for example, we could, and we did. If we need to do it for a big infrastructure build, we can, and we did. If we want to do it for a big technology AI initiative, we can, and we will. You know, we have access to capital all the time. Most gov- most governments can't say that. Before I let you go, let me just ask you one thing that's not uh, specifically related to debt ceiling, but just about the American economy. Uh, you have a recent piece at CNN.com or CNN Business. How to characterize the American economy from broken to just bizarre. COVID crashed the economy three years ago with no playbook for a wild recovery that would follow. Shutdowns, disease outbreaks, disrupted global supply chains, leading to the highest inflation in 40 years and eventually to aggressive rate hikes from global central banks. Economists have forecast for months that a recession is just around the corner. And yet the U.S. economy today is growing. The job market is strong and the consumer is still spending. Where are we at? Where are we going? And you know what? I wrote that, what, last week maybe? And today we got jobless claims, still historically low. It's a proxy for layoffs. Only 229,000, I think, is a low number. Um, we got a new read on the first quarter GDP, stronger than the original read, 1.3%. I mean, some would call that just above a stall in the American economy. But it's not the recession. We have been waiting for re- This is the longest recession watch in the history of recession watches. We've been waiting for this for like two years. And still, these numbers keep keep coming in there. So I, I'm calling the economy resilient. It's just resilient. And we hear how people are worried about, you know, a recession or worried about their pocketbooks, but we're going to have a record travel season this summer, people getting on planes and buying expensive plane tickets to go places. You know, leisure and hospitality can't keep up with the demand for bars and restaurants and movie theaters and, and going out. So it's that's why I say it's bizarre. I mean, the numbers tell me the economy is resilient um, but the consumer sentiment surveys tell me people feel like crap. And I'm, mm-hmm. I blame it all on the, the you know, the, it, this is the hangover of COVID. It's still yeah. the COVID hangover. We've lived through something truly traumatic. Yeah, you can say that again. All right. Well, we got to get back to talking about some of the issues of uh, how, how they affect families, how they affect people, how they affect adolescents, all these things that you and I used to talk about in your old show, Your Money. Uh, I miss talking about those things. We should do it. Absolutely. And now I'm going to go have a glass of champagne with Caitlin Collins. Glass of champagne (laughs) at 945 in the morning. I love it. Enjoy. And thank you so much, Christine, for talking to me as always. Thanks, Pete. 
All right, Christine Romans, go follow her and let her know that you're here on the show and thank her because otherwise she won't know. It's always great to get her on and also really great to have her help me launch Can You Talk Real Quick, which is the new series I'll be doing here hopefully every week at least, if not probably even more. We'll see. Maybe I'll never do it again. But you know me, over promise, under deliver, but always working really hard to bring you the best I can. At least that's how I see myself. How do you see me? I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, for subscribing, and let me know what I could do better. Just email me, Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Send me your number and maybe we could talk real quick. All right. Talk to you later. This has been an SUPD production. Thank you for listening. The talking stops now. I'm just kidding. I'm still here. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs>